Check out trainertests.com for next generation VCP prep exams that include this and many other videos. In this video, we'll look at VMware's Virtual SAN or vSAN. And we'll talk about how vSAN can be used to allow local storage to be used as a shared data store. We need shared storage for a number of vSphere features, including vMotion, HA, DRS. So in order to enable those features, if we don't have a dedicated hardware storage array, we can use vSAN on a cluster of ESXi hosts to leverage local storage in the form of disk groups. We can take all of that local storage and combine it to form a large shared data store that's accessible to all of the hosts in that cluster. And the performance of vSAN is enhanced by solid state drives that are used to provide a write buffer and a read cache. Now, before we get into the specifics of vSAN, let's just take a moment to talk about host clustering quickly. A cluster is a logical grouping of ESXi hosts. So let's say we have a group of hosts and a virtual machine is running on host ESXi01. If you want virtual machines to automatically fail over to other hosts when one fails, you can configure high availability. If we want virtual machines to automatically vMotion for load balancing purposes, we can configure DRS, Distributed Resource Scheduler. And maybe we want to utilize the local storage of our ESXi hosts and present it as a shared data store across the entire cluster. That's what we can do with vSAN. So on our ESXi hosts, we'll organize storage into something called disk groups. And within the disk groups, we're going to have persistent storage. Typically, as we see here, there's six hard disk drives, or could be less, there can't be more, a maximum of six capacity devices per disk group, and a single flash device, in this case an SSD. So on our slide here, we see six disk groups. Host ESXi01 happens to have two disk groups, and each disk group has persistent storage in the form of hard disk drives. And it also has a read cache and write buffer in the form of solid state drives. This capacity is combined to form a shared vSAN data store, which is available to all of our ESXi hosts in this cluster. And it will be comprised of all of the space in all of these disk groups on the ESXi hosts. I could add additional hosts, and I can even add more hosts that don't have any local storage at all if I want to. You can have hosts that don't provide any capacity, but simply use the vSAN data store to store their VMs. But we need to have at least three hosts that are contributing storage to the vSAN cluster. So that's what we see here, our first three hosts. And one of the really key factors in the performance of vSAN is the network that's used to interconnect those hosts. So ideally, you're going to use 10 gigabit ethernet to interconnect these ESXi hosts. vSAN is based on a VM kernel port. So notice on all three ESXi hosts, I have a VM kernel port labeled vSAN VM kernel 2. All of the reads and writes that are destined for vSAN flow through that VM kernel port. Because you may have objects for virtual machines that are actually stored on the local storage of another ESXi host. So if your virtual machine happens to be running on ESXi01, but its VMDK is stored on ESXi02, it will access its VMDK over this vSAN network. So it's critical, number one, that it performs well. And that's why we have 10 gig Ethernet. Now vSAN is supported on 1 gig Ethernet as well, but 10 gig is recommended. And number two, it's important that this is redundant. That's why you see in each of my ESXi hosts, I have a physical adapter connected to one switch, and I have another physical adapter connected to another switch. 
That way, if a physical switch fails, if a VM NIC fails, which, which are my physical adapters, if any of those physical components fail, my storage network will continue to operate normally. Now, a key part of vSAN is storage policies. So here we see an example of a storage policy in which we have multiple data stores at the bottom of the screen. vCenter uses something called storage providers to understand the capabilities of underlying storage hardware. Like if one data store is replicated or if another data store has RAID 5 or RAID 10 or whatever, we can then create storage policies that specify certain capabilities like disk speed or RAID level. And we can then assign those storage policies to virtual machines to govern how those virtual machines are actually stored. There are storage policies that are specific just to vSAN that determine how many hosts your data is striped and mirrored across and different criteria like that. That's specific to vSAN. And some of that will probably make a lot more sense after we take a look at the underlying architecture of how vSAN actually stores virtual machine objects. Right. Now, before we jump into this, I just want to take a moment to say you might be thinking, well, how am I going to remember all this for my VCP exam? If you're planning on taking the VCP6 data center virtualization exam, I strongly recommend going to www.trainertests.com and check out those practice exams because they include met this and many other embedded videos explaining the answers to over 170 questions. So check that out if you're going to take your VCP exam. Okay, so back to the storage of our virtual machine objects. For each virtual machine, the data that makes up that VM is broken down into different objects. So here we see Virtual Machine 1. Virtual Machine 1 has a VMDK. That's one object. And other objects include the vSwap file or snapshots or the, the home namespace of a VM. That includes the VMX files. So vSAN takes all of these little objects that make up our virtual machine and it mirrors them to multiple ESXi hosts. It mirrors them so that if a single ESXi host fails, like in this case ESXi02 were to fail, that's where VM1's VMDK resides. But it's also been mirrored to ESXi03, so now VM1 can tolerate a single host failure without data loss. And this is where our storage policy comes in. We'll govern how many uh, mirrors and stripes of these virtual machine objects should exist. For example, if you want VM1 to tolerate more than one host failure, you could mirror it to additional hosts. That, of course, will consume additional space. So you can configure those storage policies uh, based on whatever your priorities happen to be. And from a performance perspective, we're hoping that we're not going to have to use storage policies to govern that because our performance should come from this flash layer that exists within our disk groups. So 70% of flash capacity is dedicated to a read cache. And the read cache contains frequently read data. So when our virtual machines read data from that read cache, latency is very low because it's served up by the SSD that's part of our disk group. So for example, let's say that virtual machine one in our diagram here needs to read some data from disk. So that blue read box just appeared. That's a read operation that it needs to carry out. So that read request will flow over the VCN network, hit the host where that data is stored, and if that data happens to be stored in the SSD, that read request is going to be completed very quickly. However, 
What if it's trying to read some data that's not frequently read? Some data that actually exists on our persistent storage and not on the SSD. Well, this is called a cache miss. And the data is going to have to be retrieved directly from the hard disk. So this is going to be significantly slower. So the goal with virtual SAN is to store all of the most high value data, the frequently read information on our SSD. And that's what 70% of our SSD capacity in each disk group is allocated to. It's allocated to providing a read cache. The remaining 30% of that SSD capacity acts as a write buffer. So if Virtual Machine 1 needs to write some data to disk, it'll actually write it to the SSD. And then after the fact, the SSD will copy that data to the persistent storage. I think of this kind of as the equivalent of returning a book to the library. When you go to the library, you simply drop off the book at the front desk. That's like a virtual machine sending a write operation to SSD. You don't need to go and reshelve that book. If you did have to reshelve every book you took back to the library, it would take a lot longer. Now, if your virtual machine had to write all of those write operations to hard disk, that would take a lot longer too. So that's the purpose of the write buffer in our SSD. If you found this video useful, go to www.trainertests.com. We have practice exams with this and many other similar embedded videos. You can try a free demo and we give a 100% money back guarantee. There's over 170 questions on the VCP6 data center virtualization exam that are aligned to that exam blueprint. And when you complete your practice exam, it'll report back to you with a breakdown of the blueprint and exactly which areas you need to focus on. So check out www.trainertests.com for your VMware exam certification needs.